we'll just see your demo. Just before we go into the demo, can you all tell me what is, do you all know what is a pipeline? Do you all know what is a data flow? Uh, those two aspects of the data factory. Uh, have you all ever studied about it? Because like I said, this is a prerequisite and this course does not cover, you know, talking about pipelines, but I'll give you all a general idea about it if you all don't know about it. Please let me know. Okay. So at times, uh, there are situations in an enterprise where we need to perform something called as data integration and data movement. Like we all know that in today's time, there are lots of sources from where data is coming, correct? We have sources like databases, data warehouses. We have sources like data lakes. We have sources like IoT devices, social media platforms, correct? Where, from where data is being generated, correct? And like I explained, within the organization also, within an enterprise, we can have multiple such storages or multiple sources from where data is coming. So the very first thing that we need to do is extract the data. Okay, now the next step is either you load the data into a destination and then you perform transformations or once you have extracted the data, okay, there and there you kind of do some transformations. Now, what do I mean by transformations? Like we saw, like we know that the data that we get, it's not going to be perfect, right? It's going to have some discrepancies. It is going to have some. Um, just it's going to have some discrepancies. It is something that will have uh, data that is that requires to be cleaned, correct? Like, let's say uh, there is some uh, column that I don't require. Let's say there is some uh, rows that are extra, which I don't require. Okay. The column name is something else. Okay. I want a different column name, but the column name that I'm receiving is something else. Okay. Then uh, you can have like um, data types are different. Okay. You were expecting a text type of data, but you're getting an integer. So you would need to do conversion. You need to convert the type of the data. So all these steps or remove missing values. Okay, you can have missing values. You can have lots of other things which you would need to remove. You need to clean. You need to transform, modify. Okay, so that is the next step that you would do. Okay, so either you first of first step is going to remain the same. So I'm talking about ET and ELT, okay? So ETL, E stands for extract, T stands for transform, and L stands for load. So either you first extract, so the step one remains the same, the, the next two steps are a little different, okay? So when I want to perform ETL, let's say I want to perform ETL, okay? The commonly used tool, Okay, the commonly used software tool or service is the Azure Data Factory. Now, why, what is Data Factory? It is nothing but a data integration and data movement tool that helps you to perform this trans ETL step. Okay, so it will help you extract data from multiple sources transform it and load it to a destination. Now the destination again can be something else. It can be a storage account. It can be a database. It can be a data warehouse. Okay, but it will be one single location, not multiple sources from where you are getting data. All of them will be like clubbed together and put at a single location so that you know in case you want to do any other like, like for a data analyst, he wants to analyze the data. Okay, let's say marketing data, we all know comes from social media. Come, so where do they store the data finally? Ultimate data. We need a destination, correct? So that is what Azure Data Factory does. And it uses two things. One is the pipeline. So what is a pipeline? Pipeline is nothing but a sequencing. I'll, I'll put it in simple terms. Sequencing of activities. Now, what are these activities? Activities are nothing but actions that you want to perform, okay, in a pipeline. Now, I told you, I want to, let's say, for example, I have some data, 
in a uh, azure blob storage okay and i want to move this data into the lake house since we are talking about microsoft fabric so i'm going to stick to those terms okay let's say i want to move the data okay so in the lake house if i go you saw that for me there is no option if you come here and come to files and just say upload so if you see here you have no option to get data from a blob storage you have to browse from there you have to browse from your local system now let's say i have a data that is coming from azure blob storage or data is coming from an azure database or data or some other database or some other source the data is coming from how do i ingest that data or how do i yeah so you know the integration it is called ingestion by that Okay, so how do I ingest the data? How do I move the data? Okay, into the lake house. I don't have an option to do that for me right now. It's just go to the local system and down uh, upload it from there. What would I need to do? I would need to first of all download it from the blob storage. Let's say you don't have access to the blob storage. Okay, you just have the access key. Okay, or the shared access token. What do you do in that? What? How do you? load the data into the lake house so if you have to do some activities like these okay for that you use the pipeline that is there so pipeline is like sequencing of these activities and the activity that you would use here is called as a copy tool or a copy activity now what does this copy activity mean in simple english it's like copying from one uh, source to the destination Okay, so what it will do, it will copy the data. Okay, move the data from the blob storage, not actually move, move, it will stay in the blob storage because it's in another cloud. Okay, just copy, create a copy of that data. Okay, so it's coming from another source. Okay, because I don't have that option of uploading directly to the workspace, sorry, into the lake house. So this is what is called as a pipeline. And activities you can have like a lookup activity. You can have like if you want to do a looping operation, let's say you have to copy multiple tables, okay, from a blob a database or a data warehouse into a blob storage in the form of files, okay, CSV files, JSON files, whichever file you want, okay. Let's say you want to copy the tables into those files, okay. So what you can do there, you can go one at a time. Right. Uh, first, you will copy the first file, then the second file, then the third file. Correct. So that kind of an activity in the data factory is called as a bulk copy activity. So this bulk copy, basically, what it will do, it will for that you use a activity called as for each. So how we do looping in any programming language? If I have a set of, let's say, I have a collection of values, collection of numbers, collection of strings collection of whatever you name it so something that has a collection right we we want to access every element inside it so what do we do we kind of go one after the other we keep on looping it right we kind of start iterating it so the same activity if you want to do on top of your data that is called as a for each activity so you can use this and all the other activities that were there in the data factory in over here. Now I talked about the transformation. Okay, right? we talked about the transformation where you clean the data and you modify the data. You change, remove missing values, remove errors. You change the column name, change the data type, etc. These are nothing but transformation steps. So if I have to perform these transformation steps, okay, or I want to perform the ELT, basically it is ETL. Sorry, not ELT, ETL. Okay, basically, if I want to perform ETL, the tool that is responsible is called as the data flow tool. Okay, so this has been given a generation to Gen 2 name. Why? Because um, in the data factory, the uh, data flow that is there, it is a little different compared to the uh, compared to this one. There, it is more like drag and drop. Okay, data factory is more like a drag and drop or a low code. 
drag and drop low code tool or a service, I would say. Whereas this is more like an uh, you graphical user interface kind of a tool. Okay, graphical user interface. Meaning, if you have used something called as Power Query Editor, okay, this is nothing but put online. So, data flow gen 2 is nothing but Power Query Editor put online. So, this is what you will study in the next module. Okay, you will, uh, we will look at the data factory experience in that you have two things that is a pipeline and the other is a data flow. Okay, then of course you can work with notebooks. You can now let's say you want to um, hear what did we do when we worked with the notebook is that we got the data into the lake house, correct? We got into the like we uploaded the data into the lake house, correct? And uh, we then created a data frame out of it, let's say I want to still get data directly into the notebook, okay, without using the data flow or without using, uh, you know, without using data flow or either the data pipeline, okay, directly I want to ingest the data into the notebook. So that is also possible, okay, in your fabric. And I will show you. I will just show you how you can do it. We will not. Uh, I, I will. I mean, I'll give you. I'll show you the code, but we will not demo. I mean, I'll not give you the demo of it. Okay, but let's see how you can ingest data. Okay, uh, how can you create a pipeline in over here? So again, I'm coming to my workspace. I'll click on new, and if you see here, you have these two experiences. That is your data pipeline. So go ahead and click on this. And here I'm going to give it a simple name. I'll just say copy blob to LH and just say create. Till the time I'm just going to log into my Azure portal. I have a blob storage already created, so I'm just going to open that. Okay, so this has been created. Now what we are going to do is here we are going to do a simple copy activity. So here you have, uh, you can select directly from here or you can just create a blank canvas. Okay, and to that you can add the copy data tool. Okay, so if you see here you have the other. So these things that you see, okay, listed over here are called as activities. They are nothing but like actions that you want to perform. Okay, and if you sequence these actions, Okay, like you want to first copy, then you want to uh, do a for each, then you want to do some other activity. Okay, you want to filter out things or whatever. You can do that. Okay, you can just sequence them and you can just link them. That is called as a pipeline. So here I'm just going to do a simple copy. I'm going to create a copy pipeline. So select this. And I'll just rename this. Now here I need to give a source. So like I told you here, uh, we are going to get data from a block storage into the lake house. Okay, so how I'm going to select on external, not the internal workspace we are going to use, but we are going to use an external. And I'm going to create a new connection. So similar to the link service of Azure Data Factory. So now if you see here, you are not just getting to upload data from your local system, but you can upload data from various sources. 
okay you name the source and you have it you have amazon also but you know what will happen still a copy of the data will be loaded okay the shortcut feature that i talked about will not move the data the data will remain at the source level so that is the difference between the two okay so you can see you have all the sources so you can work with m365 sharepoint you have you have dynamics dataverse okay all the azure related services all are present you have generic protocols as well http o data you have no sql that is mongo db services and apps so you can see you have files okay databases okay external databases all of them are there so i'm going to go with the block storage they continue and i'm going to take a block storage i have multiple block storages created i hope you all know how to work with it and i'll just select this storage and i'm going to copy the name and i'm going to create a new one so that you all come to know how to create a connection string okay so here instead of going anonymous we can go with different authentication type okay so i'm going to go with a uh, sas token that is there so i need to first of all generate a sas token so i'll come to my storage account and i'm going to generate one here so if you see this is the place where you can and this is going to allow these things and just say generate sas so it has generated i'm going to copy this and i'm going to come here and just paste it so now it will create a connection with my data okay at with the block storage just say create now i want to specify which file i want to copy okay so we can do that by coming to the browse feature so if you click on browse it will go to the container that is present in your blob storage okay actually not blob storage i should say it should be a storage account because this container is nothing but a blob container so i'm going to come here and i'll select a There are lots of files, so that is why it is taking time to load. Okay, and I'm going to go with this particular file. Okay, or I'll go with this rather than that. Just say okay. So here you can see the path. This is the path of the file that I have given. So this is my source. Now I need to configure the destination. and over here i'm going to go with the workspace that i have okay here we already have an existing lake house so i'm going to select this lake house itself and i'm going to say i don't want it in the form of tables but i want it in the form of files okay and i'm going to just say cars dot csv give the destination file a name okay you need to configure this all the time i mean you if you want the same name you can keep it but otherwise it i would recommend changing the name so this is done okay now let's execute this pipeline just before you execute ensure that you save it okay and now here you can see that you have three things one is validate the other is run and the third thing is schedule now validate as the name says validate it will validate your pipeline so this is this that you see here okay is your canvas okay and onto your canvas you will create a pipeline so as of now this is only one activity you can have multiple activities and if you link them it becomes a pipeline okay so this validate will of course validate your pipeline the next run will execute the pipeline will trigger the pipeline in simple terms or sorry in simple terms it means it will execute it will get it implemented okay now let's say so this run will immediately execute the pipeline so the moment you click on this okay the pipeline will be executed 
Now, let's say you don't want to execute the pipeline immediately. OK, let's say after an hour, after a day, et cetera, whenever you want to, OK, you can execute it by coming to schedule. So you schedule whenever you want to, uh, you want the pipeline to be triggered or executed. And at that moment, so let's say your data kind of refreshes every day at six in the evening. So what you can do once that new data comes in after like 630, you can just schedule the pipeline and it will execute the data that is uh, I mean, execute the pipeline and you can do the activity or whatever that is required. OK, so now what I'm going to do, I'm just going to say run. So it is getting executed. It will take some time. So my pipeline has been executed. Now if I have to see the output, we all know it has gone to the lake house. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to navigate to my lake house. And in files, you should see. And in files, you should see the data being copied. So this is the data. And if you come to your block storage and you see the same data. So if you see, this is the exact same data that has been copied. So let's say you want to get data into the lake house from different sources. This is how you can execute a pipeline. OK, then you can even have data flows, like I said. So I'll just show you all quickly how to create a data flow. So data flow is nothing but a transformation tool that you can use. OK, so I'll just say new data. Um, I'll just say data flow. And now if you see here, once it gets loaded, you should see a power query editor. OK, it's exactly the same thing. OK, it's a power query editor, nothing different. If you've worked with power query editor, you will be able to work with the data flow on Microsoft Fabric. So this is an ETL tool. Keep that in mind. So you have to first of all extract data. So if you have to extract data, they have an option called as get data. So if you click on it, you will see a lot of options. If you come to more, you will see you can not just upload data from your device, OK, but you can also get data from external sources if you click on new and the exact same sources that were there in the pipeline, you could get data from there. So these are various ways, OK, from where you can load data into the lake house. OK, so this is what it is. OK, so here you can get data from the blob storage. You can get data from your databases that is as your storages or external this thing. So if you see here, they have more options. OK, even Power Platform, if you're uh, if you're familiar even with Microsoft Fabric, in internal sources that are there. OK, you can get data even from there. OK, and yeah, so you can see you have multiple sources. So as of now, I'm going to go with upload. I'm going to browse from my local system and I'll just take this particular file. It's being done. Now let's do a quick preview. So it will do some schema mapping. It will just map it appropriately. And once this is done, so this is your data. This is how it looks like. Just say create. I don't need this. So 
So the data has been loaded. Now here you can do lots of transformations, okay, on the data. So transformation meaning you can drop a column, you can remove a column, okay, you can like rename a column. If you double click on it, you can like rename a column. So it was only a curve weight, okay. It was a curve weight. So if you see here, earlier, this was the name. Now you can just double click on it and you can just change the name. So let's say it's Kahavet. Okay. You can then now if you see here, you can filter out certain things. So if you click on this drop down. Okay. And if you see here, there is some error in the data. Right. Instead of gas, you're seeing guess another third value. Okay. Whereas it has been spelled out incorrectly. Okay, it has been typed in incorrectly, whatever you can just say. So let's say you want to change this value. Okay, let's say you want to change this value. So how can you do it? You can just select this column. You can come to transform column and you have this option of replace values. And if you click on replace values, so what you will do, you will just say, please find this particular word. Okay, and replace it with this. This is the correct word. And the moment you do that and you just say, okay. And now if you see here that there are only two values. So you can do something like this. Okay. You can change the text of the column. Okay. So if you come to format, you can make this from lowercase to uppercase. If you see lowercase to uppercase, so it has changed the text of the column. I mean, of the data within the column. You can make it back to lowercase. Okay. You can capitalize the first letter, something like this. Okay. All of this you can do. Then you can split a column. Let's say I want to split this column, or let's say I don't want, or you can even remove a column. So there are two ways in which you can remove. One is you can come to remove columns. Okay, and you can just say remove columns. So what will happen? The column that you have selected, okay, keep in mind the column that you have selected will be removed. Sorry. So you can just see it will, it will be removed. The other that you can do, let's say you have selected this column and leaving this column, the column that you have selected, except that you want to, you know, drop all the other columns or remove all the other columns. This is what the second option does. Okay. So this is what you can do. So here I'm just going to say remove column because I don't want that column. Let's say, okay. The other thing that you can do is you can split a column. So you can just come here. I'll just say by delimiter. So wherever you encounter, let's say a space. Okay, let's say space, split the column. Okay, wherever you encounter space, just split the column. So that's what it will do. So wherever a space comes, it will split the column. So you can just go ahead and delete these columns. You can even click on the delete button from your keyboard and your columns will be removed. You can even remove this if you don't want, just say delete and you can call, you can rename this, just say company name. You can just rename this also. Let's say you want to keep this car name. Okay, whatever. You can just do the this thing. So this is what you can do. Now, let's say you've completed the transformations. You, you can even add a column. Okay, let's say you have a sales data and uh, you want to calculate the total amount that is there. So sales amount, which is nothing but quantity multiplied by unit price, or you want to uh, add a column based on the revenue, okay, which is nothing but the revenue, which is nothing but quantity multiplied by unit price. So you can definitely do that by coming to custom column and you can add another column in your data. So once you have done the transformations, okay, so this is the, so you extracted the data, you transformed the data, and now you need to load the data. You need to put it into a destination. So if you see here, you have an option called as destination. So if you click on this dropdown, in Microsoft Fabric, as of now, 
there are only four destinations that you can have one is a warehouse the other is a lake house and the other is a sql database and the fourth one is a data explorer why because when you do transformation this data that you have uploaded the default form is a table okay if you see here even if you read here the default form okay format i should say is a table so a table is either loaded in the lake house which is nothing but a delta table correct then in a data warehouse okay or in a database or in the pusto database or the azure data explorer okay these are the only four places where a table gets uploaded so that is why only those four destinations have been given to you okay so you can select one so i'll go with the lake house since i have a lake house I'll just say next. And I'll select this workspace that I have. And I'll select this lake house. And I'll just say next. So here it is doing a schema mapping. Just say save, save settings. And now if you see, the destination has been added. So there are two ways in which you can execute this. One is either you put it into a pipeline. Okay, you can add a data flow even in your pipeline. Or the other way is you directly publish from here. So if you just click on publish. And it will take some time to publish. So if you see here, this is how it will work. So whatever. So the moment you say publish, all the transformations and everything will be executed. Okay, they will be like the trigger of the pipeline. So publish is nothing but that. Okay, it will publish the transformations or the modifications that you have done. So it depends on the license that you have. So if you recall, we talked about the licenses. So depending on the license that you have, that amount, that much data you can upload. So it's all again based capacity is based on your license, the data upload. Okay, how much limit? Okay, so if you um, if I come here and I say. So it all depends on the license. This did not change for uh, this thing. So if you see here, scroll down, you will see depending on the license that you have. Okay, because it is nothing but Power BI licenses are also there. It is the same thing. So depending on that, your memory size will be determined. How much data you can upload, how much refresh can you do on the data? Okay, like for Pro, it's just eight and premium licenses have more. Okay, so this is how it has been separated out. So it depends on the license that you have. So it has published. So now if I go to my lake house, and I come to the tables, I refresh my tables. So you should see a car raw this thing, which will have all the transformations or something. Okay, that is there. Keep in mind, this will not get loaded in the form of a file. Okay, the destination will always be a table. 
So this is how it will look like. So if you see. Okay, so this is more or less module two. Okay, let's just go back to the presentation. Okay, so we talked about data flow. This is nothing but data flow. Even the visual query, if you remember, guys, okay, it's the same thing. It's just visual there. It is more in terms of visualizations for people who don't understand coding. A much better tool is the data flow, okay, uh, where you are not doing or writing any code. Okay, it's an ETL tool and it's just been integrated with Power Query Editor. Okay, so you can perform. These are the benefits. And limitations. So, like I told you, the limitation is the data is going to be uploaded only in the form of a table. So, this is the interface. This is what we saw. So, the first row that is there, it is called as a Power Query ribbon. The second one is where your queries are or your tables are. Okay, you saw that. The other diagram is for your visual query. Okay, then this is where your output will be data where you can see the data and on the right hand side, if you see you have the steps that you have executed. OK, it will show you what kind of steps you have executed in the applied steps that are there. So this is how your data flow is. OK, we saw how you can integrate. So I told you all you can add the data flow in a pipeline. Let's say at some point you want to perform data transformations OK, within your pipeline. OK, let's say you have, you have extracted source data from various sources. OK, you have done the copy activity and now you want to do transformation. So you can just go to the data, upload the data and you can just perform the transformation and you can just call that data flow in your pipeline. So whenever you know, uh, you don't have to manually do it again and again. OK, you just place it in one of the this thing in your pipeline and whenever there's a new data that comes in, okay, it will kind of uh, refresh it, uh, ca capture that new data and whatever transformations it was supposed to do, it will perform those exact same transformations. So this is what you can even use data flow as an activity in your pipeline, okay? So we saw how to work with it. This is okay, we can just skip this. Then we saw about pipelines. OK, pipelines, I told you, is nothing but a sequence that you create. It is nothing but a orchestration tool. You can call data factory as an orchestration tool. OK, orchestration meaning scaling faster so that your data movement is far faster. Data ingestion is faster. OK, so you can get orchestration with data factory. So this is what basically pipeline is. OK, you can do data transformations. You have the capability of parameters. Parameters is like you are asking the user to enter a value. OK, so let's say we did the copy activity where I browsed for the file. Correct. So what you can do is instead of you browsing, you can tell the user which file you want to copy. So you can tell ask the user, please enter the name of the file and you can uh, trigger and you can just copy that file later. So this is what basically parameters does. It asks input from the user. So you can definitely do that. Now, let's say you don't want to create a pipeline. OK, some activity, some pipelines are there, which you know are common. OK, which uh, which you can. So this is about the copy activity. We have seen this. Yeah, so at times there can be situations where you want to, you know, uh, directly deploy, I mean, directly create a pipeline without you actually creating and sequencing a pipeline. So in that case, you know, there are some ready-made templates or blueprints that Microsoft has already created, which you can just use and it, it will be added to the canvas. Okay, and that will kind of 
you just have to add the data sources and the destination where you want to copy the data and you can just trigger the pipeline immediately. So it saves time for you to manually act, uh, create a pipeline and then execute it and etc, etc, etc. OK, so you can just uh, avoid that and you can use a ready made template which uh, Microsoft has given it to you and you can just start immediately executing and immediate data will you know you just have to configure the source and the destination and your data will be copied then we have seen this okay validate run schedule okay you can even view the history of your this thing why did the pipeline fail what was the reason for the failure what was the error so you can do that you can view that in your view run history so it's like a gantt chart that gets created. Okay, it's like a Gantt chart. This is a T that gets created, and you can visualize why it went wrong, visualize the entire data pipeline, okay, and analyze the error, okay, why did the execution fail, okay, for each and every activity that is there in your pipeline so one active let's say you have two three activities so one activity can uh get executed okay but the other can fail so why did it fail you can do a thorough analysis of that as well so this is what is the pipeline so we saw how can you ingest data into the lake house using the pipeline and the data flows okay the other way that you can ingest data is using the notebooks. OK, uh, so in the notebooks, the data was coming through the lake house. Correct. We had to first of all either upload the data directly into the lake house from our systems, from our laptops, or we could do it through the data pipeline or through the data flows. Let's say I don't want to use any of those things. OK, you can still directly load data through the notebook, but you need to know how to code it. You need to know coding. OK, you need to know one of the languages. OK, and you can definitely upload data, load data from external sources. So this is how you can do it. So this is how you can do it from a blob storage. But you need to know how to mount like in Databricks. This is what we basically do. We mount the storage first. Right, we give the uh, storage account name, we give the blob container name, we give the uh, SAS token, okay, and then we kind of construct something called as a connection string, okay. It's called using the DB utils library also, like, like in Databricks, that's what we do. But here also the same steps you can do, okay. So you can either connect to the blob storage, you can connect to the database, okay, using something called as a service principle. OK, all that you can do and you can directly ingest the data into the lake house without using, without uploading, without uh, using the data pipeline or the data flow. So this is what basically is being talked about. Then here we are talking about some more optimization techniques. OK, in um, your lake house, so because we uh, we can work with delta tables and we can work with we we can do something called as partitioning okay partitioning is like dividing the files okay like let's say you have a sales data okay and you have sales data for uh, let's say 20, 2019 2020 and 2021 so in one file itself okay let's say you have it in one file itself so you can segregate that data okay according to the year you can partition the data according to the year, okay? And uh, like you will have 20, 20, 2019 in one folder, 2020 in one folder, 2021 in one folder, okay? So that is called as partitioning. And why do we do partitioning then? Accessing the data becomes easy, processing the data becomes easy and faster because of which then we can uh, receive, uh, which, because of which we can achieve maximum optimization, okay? So if you want to like optimize it much further, so like once you have analyzed the data, you have read the data. So for reading, partitioning is good, but you at times once you have processed the data, you have transformed the data, you do write 
the data somewhere, right? You stored the data after the transformations and all of that in the notebook. I'm talking in terms of notebook. So you kind of write the data, let's say, into a delta table or into a file, which is a paraquet file, correct? So you can even optimize the writing process that is there. And there are two ways you can optimize it in your fabric. One is you use the uh, optimize write. Okay, it is called as optimize write. And the second one is called as a reorder. Okay, so these are the two optimization techniques that you can use when you are writing a adequate file or any uh, data frame you want to write to a delta table. So more on this, we will, this gets covered when you do the training. Okay. So these are some of the ways in which, uh, uh, like, if you ask me what way, in what method I should upload the data into the lake house, it is totally up to you. Okay, it depends what access you have and what kind of transformations and cleaning and etc. that you want to do. Okay, so these are the questions that you should consider while you are ingesting data into your lake house. Okay, now the next module talks about the medallion architecture in the lake house. What is the medallion architecture and etc. So this is what, so just to give you a brief up, like um, uh, it, medallion architecture is nothing but a, like a layered architecture, like a buffer zone, okay, uh, where uh, you uh, get the data. So the first layer where the data is, so the data generally that gets loaded in a data lake, okay, is raw, right? It's not something that is, um, we all know that it is not something that is perfect. We need to make it perfect. We need to clean it. We need to transform it. Okay. So the first layer in the lake house, okay, that receives this raw data is called as the bronze layer. Okay. But why, in, why the name medallion? Medallion is like medals we get of in a race or uh, in a competition, right? Where the third uh, winner, I mean, the third, the one who's come third gets a bronze medal, right? So that's what you are doing here. You're kind of giving medals, you're allocating uh, medals to the different data, okay? Now the data is raw, so you give it a bronze medal, okay? Now, once you have got the raw data, you need to kind of transform it. We all know we need to make it perfect. So when you do that, it is in the silver layer. Okay, when you do the transformations, you do the validations. Okay, that is called as the silver layer. So anyone who comes second gets a silver medal. So the validated data, transformed data in your lake house is called as the is done at the silver layer. And once you have done those transformations, okay, you need to give it to a gold layer. Okay, where this is the actual data, the transformed data that you get where you can do multiple other things on top of it, do uh, data analysis, do data science. Okay, so uh, there is a lot of benefit of using this. So this is what uh, using a me medallion architecture. So this is what this module talks about. Okay, so this is how it is. So if you see, these are the three layers. Now, if you have to ingest raw data. So this is how you can ingest. So this is what we just saw. Then if you want to do transformations, you can use the data flows or the notebook. Okay. And like I said, you want to do reporting, you want to do analysis, you want to do uh, data science. Okay. Even that, if you want to do, you can definitely do that. Okay. For that, you use the gold layer. So this is, if you kind of layer your data, okay, put them, instead of putting them directly into the gold layer or into some other destination, it is always better that you stage it, okay, and then uh, by moving across stages, you do the transformations and then you load the data into the final stage. So this is how, this is what basically is talked about in this particular module. So with this, we come and end to module two. Okay. So the first module, let me just give you an overview. 
okay talked about microsoft fabric we talked about the challenges how did microsoft fabric come into picture okay we talked about one lake what is one lake why do we need one lake all of that we talked about the licenses we talked about the capacities the skews units okay then we moved on to understand what is lake house okay uh, understand the concept of lake house which is nothing but data lake plus your data warehouse Okay, and then we saw how to create a lake house, uh, how to work with lake house, how you can ingest data into a lake house using three things. One is you either upload the data directly. The second is either you use the data pipeline or you use the data flows. And the third thing is you use the notebook. Okay, we also saw how we can analyze data in the lake house using the notebooks. Okay, how can you create delta tables? OK, and I told you that in the lake house, you have the files, you have the tables. If you're storing data, the format of the of the files, OK, that one lake understands or lake house understands is nothing but the paraquet format. So it has kind of generalized the format, OK, on top of the lake house. OK. Um, Uh, I will be sharing. I mean, I'll be sharing the links for where you can get this uh, architecture. I'll definitely share that, so you don't have to worry. Okay, I'll definitely show you the link, or I'll just show it to you. Doesn't make any sense. So this is the medallion architecture. This is the last slide that we saw. OK. So yeah, I was talking about the overview. So uh, we saw lake house. How can we ingest data? How can we analyze data in the lake house using the Spark, plus Spark compute? OK, it is nothing but Spark. And uh, it also talks about how the Spark architecture works. What is a data frame and all of that? OK, we saw how to load a data into a data frame how to read a data into a data frame, basically. This is what we saw. We saw about delta tables, the types of delta tables. OK. So this was that was module one. Then we moved on to module two, where I talked about pipelines. I showed you all how to create a simple pipeline, how to work with a data flow. OK, what, what are those two things? And if you work with a pipeline or a data flow, that experience is called as a data factory experience. OK, so those are the two ways in which you can even ingest data into the lake house. OK, now let's say you want to ingest data directly into the notebook. OK, or use the notebook, not directly into the notebook. You're not loading it into the notebook. You're loading it into the lake house. OK, let's say you want to ingest data into the lake house through the notebook. You can do that, but you need to create an external path. You need to mount the storage. OK. Uh, that is totally possible. So that's what you do. Uh, you know, so that is what you can do in second module. And finally, we looked at the medallion architecture. So it will talk more about the medallion architecture. OK, uh, what it is, why do we need it? All of that things get covered in module two. OK, so this was module two. Now let's so this was all about the lake house aspect. OK in Microsoft Fabric. The next experience okay, that we are going to talk about is a data warehouse. So before we, I start or I, uh, I go into the data warehouse, can you all tell me what is your understanding of a data warehouse? Why do we need a data warehouse? Like, What is the difference between a data warehouse and a database? Yes, guys, please let me know in the chat box. What is a data warehouse? What is the difference between a data warehouse and a database? OK, 
can you elaborate on that? What do you mean by aggregated data? Yes, guys, what is a data warehouse? Okay. So a data warehouse, to put it simply, is nothing but a place where structured data structured data is stored. It's not any data. Okay, it's structured data that gets stored in the form of tables. Okay, they are relational tables that get created. Okay, and in a data warehouse, you have two tables. Okay, unlike your normal database where the table is called a table. Okay, here you have two tables. One is the fact table. And the other is a dimension table. OK, now what is a fact table? A fact table is, let's say, I um, I have a store, OK, and I want to find, I want to keep a track of the order. Let's say I want to keep the I want to keep a track of the order or uh, data that I have. Okay, on what date was the order? Uh, you know, what date was it ordered? Who, who ordered it? Okay, what is the product that was ordered? Okay, all that if I want to find out the numeric part of the data, numeric data, or somebody has rightly said measurable data. Okay, something that I can or quantitative data like your like your primary keys which are numeric right they are primary keys let's say of other tables i want to keep it okay i can collect it that kind of a table is called as a fact table okay so that is what is a important part in the data warehouse and a dimension table is a table that describes about a particular Thing. So, like, if you want to know more about the customer, the like customer information, customer information or product information, you want to know more about it, get elaborate information about it. So, the place where you can get it, that table is called as a dimension table. And these two tables basically form the data warehouse. Okay. These two things basically form the data warehouse. Now, coming to the difference between a database and a data uh, warehouse, okay, you might be thinking both store structured data, relational data, then what is the difference between the two? The difference in between the two lies in the same exact difference between OLTP and OLAP. Do you know what is the difference between OLTP and OLAP? Yes, guys. <laughs> what is the difference between OLTP and OLA? Uh, no, it's not like current data. Okay. OLTP basically. OLTP basically when now let's say um, I have data in the database okay let's say i have an employee data we all know the employee data right employee data which will have the eids which will have the e name which will have the hire date okay which will have the salary which will have the department number etc the classic employee table okay so let's say i want to find out the Total salaries of my employees. Okay. Total salaries of my employees. So if I have this table, employee table, stored in a database, okay, if it's stored in a database, OLTP, okay, their database follows the OLTP approach. 
which means that it goes row it does a row by row it has a row by row approach now what do i mean by row by row approach in uh, reading the data okay row by row in reading the data now what do i mean by this i told you i want to find out the total salaries of my employees correct so when i say i have stored the data in a database and database follows oltp approach so oltp what it will do it will go row by row so what will it do it will come to the first record or the first row it will read the entire row okay let's say you have data here it will read the entire first row okay and now let's say in employee date in the employee table we just not have the salary column we have multiple columns there will be more more columns right it's not just this many columns there are lots of columns let's say the salary column is the 10th column in your table i'm just giving an example okay it's the 10th column in your table so in oltp what does it do first of all i told you it reads data record by record that means it goes sequentially it goes row by row correct so what it will do it will read all the other entities not entities attributes okay it will read all the other values of the columns that are there that means it will read the employee id employee name hire date department number manager name etc all of that okay and it once it will go into that entire row then it will search for the salary what will happen here the salary column is where it is the 10th column and once it reaches that column it will take the total salary of that employee i mean not the total salary it will read the salary of the employee and then take that then move to the next row read the entire row again for the next employee go to the salary column add that salary to the previous salary and so and so forth so this is how oltp approaches or this is how oltp reads the data okay when i say i want to calculate the total salaries do some group by aggregation functions this is how it will do but that is not the case with olap okay olap has a columnar approach now what do i mean by this it will it, the data will be stored in the table format okay but now if i have to calculate the total salaries of the employees instead of re reading the entire row okay record by record going sequentially calculate going to the salary column taking a salary value then adding the new salary the next salary not the new salary the next salary etc what does olap do forget this i'm just going directly to the column i'm going to calculate or i'm going to perform the aggregation function on the entire column understood this is what olap does olap instead of reading the data row by row it will read the data column wise go directly to the salary column read the entire salary column and then do the aggregation on top of that so this is the exact difference between a database and a data warehouse exactly the same thing you can so this is the functioning of the both both have both you can even create reports analyze the data select queries that you write is nothing but analysis of the data right it is nothing but analysis same thing you can do with a data warehouse but what is the main difference between the two it is nothing but the way oltp and olap works okay database goes with a oltp approach that means reads records uh, row by row whereas olap goes column wise okay so this is what you will read this is what you will study okay we are going to see the data warehouse aspect yes absolutely right when it has a columnar approach okay so what while the database you are absolutely right the performance will get affected okay uh, olap becomes much faster compared to the database so this is why it is faster why people go for data warehouse rather than a database approach okay so coming to the data warehouse so this is what we are going to see we are going to see how that you can implement the data warehouse because i told you all one lake or the lake house it is it has um 
uh, use cases, uh, if you have a small workload, there's nothing specific as such. It depends on the use case you have. There's no, there's no use case that you can have. Like, let's say you have credit card transformation or credit card fraud detection. If you want to do, then go for the OLAP kind of a thing. And if you want to do net banking or, or, or transactional related stuff, net banking or ATM and all of that, then I think the OLTP is a better approach there. So that is the difference between the two. Not much. And yeah, if you want to do more of data modeling, uh, databases, yes, you can have, but a data warehouse, you can create two models. One is the star schema and the other is a snowflake schema. So how do the two of them look? So I'll just show you the diagram. Star schema. So this is how you can scheme out or model your data. The other is a snowflake schema. So this is how your snowflake will look like. The both have dimension tables. Both have a fact. I mean fact table. But if you want to further normalize okay your dimension tables into a sub dimension table that means you want product to give you more information about the products okay then that kind of a table is called as a sub dimension table so you normalize we all know normalization which we do even in the databases okay the exact same thing is there so if you normalize a data okay that uh, is called as a sub if you normalize a dimension table that is called as a sub dimension table and you can definitely do that okay and you can scheme it out that way okay so this is one way so you have the snowflake schema and you have the star schema so this is how your star schema will look like and this is how your snowflake schema will look like OK, so these are the ways in which you can model the data in a data warehouse. So this is what you're going to see in module three. OK, A to B of a data warehouse. OK, how can you create a data warehouse? So if you recall, we had talked about. A SQL analytical. Endpoint, OK. This thing, if you recall, is a read only endpoint where you can just write DQL commands. Okay, you can't write create table, update table, alter, I mean, uh, alter table. You can't delete anything. You can't basically perform CRUD except for the R that is reading. OK, other uh, operations that are there. Basically, you cannot perform DDL or DML commands. Cannot write, actually. DDL or DML commands. OK, this you will have to, uh, this you can't do when you are working with an analytic endpoint. So when you have that analytical endpoint created, OK, it is a table, a relational table that gets created, but it has a disadvantage. OK, but now let's say you want to perform the DDL commands, create a new table, OK, a relational table, create a data warehouse where you have a fact table, dimension table. OK, you create the warehouse in Microsoft Fabric. OK. This is what you basically create. And this is what module three talks about. It talks about A to Z only and only about how you can use the data warehouse, how you can create one. How can you analyze data in a data warehouse? How can you query a data? OK. Query a data in a data warehouse. OK. 
how can you um, monitor the queries, different ways of monitoring the queries. This all you will do. You can even do data modeling, scheme it out to star schema, snowflake schema. OK, so you can do data modeling. OK. And any like all the database activities like create views or write DDL commands, write DML commands, even DQL. OK, do cross data, cross uh, table data warehousing. All of that you can do in this particular warehouse of Microsoft Fabric. So it is an entire different experience that is there that has been given to you by Microsoft Fabric. So let's see how you can create a warehouse. I'm going to create a sample warehouse. OK, I'll just come here. So you need to know all these things. It's something that all this gets covered when you do the training, actually. OK, these things get covered there. So I'm going back to my workspace. And I'm just going to say new and I'm going to come to warehouse. So this is the item. I'm going to say webinar WH, which is nothing but the warehouse. Just say create. OK, so here we are just going to. Create a data warehouse. So here we can go ahead and if you see, we can create a data warehouse from a sample data. So I'm just going to select this. Otherwise, you can even create your own this thing. OK, you can definitely do that. You can even connect this warehouse to your SQL Server Management Studio, because if you see here when we use a new SQL query, the interface is the same as your SSMS. OK, so you can definitely connect your warehouse OK, and make it act like a database also. OK, so that is also possible. Then using this warehouse, you can create a semantic model. OK, so by like semantic model, if you recall, it is used for um, creating reports dashboards. So if you see, this is a sample table that gets create sample data warehouse, sorry, which has sample tables inside it. So if I show you the model view, you will see the different tables. OK, and you can do the modeling over here. You can space them out in a star schema, snowflake schema, the way you want it, I'll just minimize the size so that I can see all the data. OK, now you can just rearrange them. You can define a model between them. Okay, decide the fact table, the dimension table, etc. All of that, you can do it over here. So let me just show it to you quickly. Yeah, so you can just then link the primary keys. OK, uh, decide what is your fact table and you can work with it. And then you can just write simple select queries, simple, I mean, DDL. And data, yeah, if you know Synapse Analytics, if you recall Synapse Analytics, you can do that using the dedicated pool in Synapse Analytics. Now the difference, we, all, we have been seeing that is that you need to configure the compute dedicated pool is very expensive. OK, you need to configure the DW units. You need to do the compute management. Here I'm not doing any of that, right? I am just uh, coming into my fabric portal and I'm just starting and I'm just creating a warehouse. OK, whereas if you were working on Synapse, you would need to configure the uh, compute. You would need to up, you know, upload the data which here also you would need to you would need to write a fact table. All of that you can do over here. Just the difference is. That uh, their compute becomes a headache, create a workspace, OK, and uh, connect 
then creating reports with Power BI becomes a challenge. Your dedicated pool has to be on constantly. Okay, that all things play a crucial role. Okay, you can even connect to the SSMS studio. So I'll just show it to you all. So I'll just start my server server SQL Server Management Studio. And I'll just show you all how to connect. It's very easy to do that. So till the time this is starting, I'll just come in two minutes. Okay, so the server has started. Now, let's say I want to connect my data warehouse even in the SQL server. So I will come here. And now if you see here, we have a warehouse that gets created. And along with that same warehouse, we have a default semantic model. Okay, in case you want to create reports, you want to create dashboards, you can definitely do that. Okay, so now let's connect this to our SQL Server Management Studio. So I'll come here, click on these three dots. Can you see you get this option of copy SQL connection string? Okay, whereas if you come over here, you will not get, okay, you can even connect to your lake house. Okay, if you see even that is possible, but you can't write DML, DDL commands. Keep that in mind, that is the difference. Okay, so you can just come here, copy this connection string, say copy and come to your server sql server paste it okay go with the mfa uh, this is the active directory and this is my username 
So my the account that I'm using in order to work with fabric, the same thing I have put over here and I can just say connect. And just enter the login details. And now if you see here, it has connected to the data warehouse. And if you expand this, if you see all the warehouses have, which are there have come in. So if you see here, even the lake house, because it has a SQL endpoint, right? The same has come over here. So if you see these tables, it will be a little different, which are the delta two delta tables that we have. Okay. Which is this. And if you expand the tables here, you will see the sample data. So if you see, these are the tables that are there. So this is how you can connect even to the SQL Server Management Studio to your SQL Server. And you can use this interface and start querying the data. That is also possible. OK, very easy to do it. Then let's just go to the presentation. Let's just see what will you look when you study. What is it that you will have in your um, data warehouse in Microsoft Fabric? So, how to choose what to where what data goes? Okay. So, in case you're working with a unstructured data or a semi-structured data, it is recommended that you use the lake house. Okay, but if you have a structured data, you want to do OLT OLAP. Okay, it is recommended that you go with the data warehouse in Microsoft Fabric. Okay, so we have seen it has both the engines in one. Okay, I don't have to configure separate engines for two different things. It is integrated into one. So we can definitely have that. Okay, so. This is what it is. So if you have to create, this is how you create a data warehouse. We have seen how to create a sim. It is very easy to create. Here I'm not managing the um, uh, everything. And you can see it has come in one workspace. Again, if I have to work on Synapse, I would have to first of all create a, um, a workspace, go into the workspace. And for that, they have a different portal. It is called as Synapse Studio. OK, you would need to go to the Synapse Studio there. You would first of all need to create a dedicated pool. Once you have created a dedicated pool, you would then need to upload the tables. Here, I didn't have to do any such things. I had I had a workspace already created. Just had to click on one button, select warehouse, give it a name, and automatically a warehouse was created for me. OK, so this is how you can do it. You can do demand you can do data modeling okay so we know there are two types one is star schema and the other is a snowflake schema okay so i told you if you want to split up normalize the dimension tables like product become categories okay or categories become products okay all that if you want to do so it is called as normalizing the data OK, if you want to do that, you can definitely do that. And that that model or that schema is called as a snowflake schema. OK, then if you then you can study about the SCD types or the time dimension uh, table because we all know that the fact table is something that only has numeric data, has only primary keys of the dimension tables. OK. The data in the dimension table is going to keep on changing, right? The product information is going to keep on changing. The categories are going to keep on changing. Okay, the geography is going to keep on changing. Your store location, you can add more store location. It's going to keep on changing. Okay, and these changes happen over a period of time or they uh, change over a time or you want to analyze this change. OK, so dimension tables are further divided. I mean, there are types of dimension table, not further divided. They are called as sub dimension tables. 
but they those dimension tables can be of two types one is the time dimension table the other is a scd table that is a slowly changing dimension table so what is the difference between the two time dimension means something that is specific to the time okay year quarter month only dealing with time okay whereas scd is in general the attributes are changing like categories customer has changed the address product price has changed okay all those changes are tracked in the scd type okay so this is how uh, you can create dimension tables types of dimension tables you can create then how can you ingest data okay into the data warehouse you will uh, we will you will see this so we have seen you can go with pipelines so if i have to show it to you so we created through a sample copy you can definitely ingest data in other ways so if you come to the warehouse and can you see you have this option get data so you have these two options so either from a pipeline okay like copy data you can do that okay directly load data from a block storage into a table or you can use the data flow if you remember the four destinations i talked about you can definitely do that over here as well okay so these are the two ways also apart from that you can use the ctas commands if you know synapse you will know all of this the copy tool okay the copy command actually not the tool copy command okay all that you can use in your data warehouse in order to ingest data into it then you can query the data if you see it is similar to your ssms studio or uh, azure data studio that is there exact same interface okay you can even visualize the queries so i talked about the visual query which is nothing but similar to your power query editor online like a data flow but it's just being visualized nothing else there's no difference between that but you're doing transformations so in case you don't know how to work with sql commands sql statements you can definitely use this visual query approach then you can build relationships okay if you have worked in power bi power pivoting if you have done exactly the same thing you can do over here okay in the model view you can just create relationships okay you can decide the cardinality in the relationships that are there sorry <clears throat> you can determine the cardinality that is there okay uh, whether it's one is to one one is to many many is to one many is to many you decide and you can even decide the direction in which the cardinality is going okay so you can definitely model your data build relationships create star schema snowflake schema okay totally up to you you can model it the way you want it then like i said there is a default semantic model that gets created so using this model you can definitely add measures okay if you uh, uh, have knowledge about power bi and how dax works you can certainly add uh, measures into your semantic model so you will have to use the just a minute yeah okay. Okay, so you you can use the default model or you can even create your own so if i have to create my own i'll just show that also to you how how you can create your own model okay semantic model so that you can use that for visualization in power bi so if you see here you have this reporting tool 
Okay, and in reporting tool, if you see here, you have this new semantic model. So if you just click on it and you select the tables that you want, okay, whichever table you want, you don't want, you just select those. And from that, you can create your own semantic model. You can give it a name, okay, and you can work uh, and create reports on top of that. So this is how you can do it. Here you have a default semantic model. And this particular feature will automatically update the semantic model if there is any change to it. OK, you can even add new measures. Currently, this has been disabled because we haven't created any model. OK, so you can just add a measure. Once you create a model, you can definitely add measures to it. OK, and if you are familiar with DAX, data analysis expressions of Power BI, exactly those measures you can add over here. OK, so this is how you can work with data modeling, create relationships, etc. in a data warehouse. So you can visualize data. You can create exact same reports as your Power BI. OK. So this is how uh, your data warehouse works. Then I talked about how you can load the data. OK, we have seen. So it basically performs. You can do ETL OK, in, uh, in your data warehousing. So generally, when somebody asks me, like, how can you create a, or how can you design a data warehouse? OK, there is an important concept of uh, loading of data into the fact table and a dimension table. So whenever you are loading data into a fact table, OK, there is a recommended strategy called as staging table. OK, now what is a staging table? A staging table is like a buffer zone. OK, it's like a buffer zone, OK, uh, which you can put like from the data source to the data warehouse, the fact table, OK, in the data warehouse. Between that, you have your staging table. So let's say you want to perform some transformations or something like that before you, you know, uh, store the data into the fact table or load the data into the fact table. You can do that, OK, in your staging table. So if you recall in the uh, lake house, it was the silver layer. OK, exactly the same thing. You can do that in your data warehouse when you are loading data into the fact table. OK, staging is used when you are loading data into the fact table. Now, why should you use staging? First of all, you can perform transformations before it is loaded into the final destination into the fact table. The other thing is Let's say um, there are certain rows or columns that you don't want to upload or you want to load in your fact table. OK, there can be certain things, right? You don't want them. So you can just drop them or avoid them from the staging table and only those tables or sorry, only the specific data that you want, you can load into your data warehouse. OK, so these are the things that you can do. In, uh, that is why a staging table is required. And then there are n number of reasons that performance improves. You have uh, n number of things. If performance improves, what happens, etc. So all that things you learn in depth once you do this particular module. OK, then if you are loading data, the other ways of loading data into a fact table is either you do a full load OK, which is like an initial load that you need to do. You populate your fact table. OK, that means whatever data you have, instead of putting it into a staging table, you directly put it into the fact table. So that is called as a full load, but it is not a good practice. It is not one of the best practices that are there. The other way is the incremental load. That means uh, whatever new data you get, you load into that, but for that you first of all need to perform the initial load or the full load. Without which you will not be able to increment the data. Correct. <laughs> OK, so. 
then if you have to create a table okay this is how you can do if you if you uh, recall i talked about the data pipeline data flow you can use the copy tool sorry the copy command so this is how you can use the copy command when you want to load data into the fact or you want to create a table in a data warehouse okay you can definitely use the copy command then you, you can even load data into the dimension tables okay dimension tables is something that you should think as who what where when and why okay of your data this is where your data is stored basically okay uh, if you want to know more about the product you have to go to the dimension table product okay there you will get the entire data of the product okay so if in like if you now i told you that the data changes right the dimension uh, data changes dimension table data changes and the change is not sudden it's not that overnight or on on a daily basis we are changing it's not like stocks right where the stock prices change on a daily basis or yeah you can even consider that to be a scd where the data is continuously changing it is changing on a daily basis or your price of a particular product okay is changing like monthly basis on a, uh, on a yearly basis or etc something that is changing okay that information you also store in the dimension table okay so fact table you can't have data that keeps on changing okay because it is something that is numeric okay it is something that is a measure, measurable output or quantitative output sorry a quantitative table but in a dimension table you can definitely change the data and the changing has types okay either it can be a type 0 type 1 type 2 why do we keep why there are types okay in a slow in a low, uh, dimension tables and those are called as scd type 1 type 2 type 3 okay why are they called as this or why do we need these types because they help you track the historical data and another difference between a database and a data warehouse okay databases if you uh, remove any category any product okay from a database okay you will not it will go away completely you will not even find the metadata of that data you will not be able to retrieve it okay but that is not the case in your data warehouse why is it possible to store the historical data it is because of these dimension tables and the slowly changing characteristic of it okay and to that you have types so type 0 basically means you can't change the data at all i mean it will not allow change for it change is something that it hates okay the second is type 1 where uh, it will kind of overwrite the uh, data okay let's say you have an you are saying at abc address so it will kind of remove the abc address and it will replace it with def okay something like that so what will happen here still you will have no history of the data the data is changing your address is changing but you don't know uh, you can't track the change or you don't have the history okay what was my previous address now my address is def but what was my previous address or yeah this is what you can call as type 1 type 2 is like it will append the change okay you can track the um data it will override but it will have a additional column uh like a flag okay it will have a flag which will state uh, true or false so true meaning this is the latest data and false that is which is the older data okay so this is how scd type 2 works okay then you have scd type 3 where you will have an additional column okay apart from this you have modified date or start date end date all those things come into picture okay but you will have to know about them beforehand okay or this gets covered even in the training uh, that is there so you will deal with scd types and then there is are some of the ways how you can perform scds so this is indicating type 2 okay 
then how can you load data into fact table so staging you can perform staging you can do oh, this is one way you can use the insert command the dml insert command sorry load like i said pipelines you can use you can load it with t sql okay you just have to use these specific statements you can even load from a uh, uh, say that if you recall i talk about that just one minute yeah so the ctas come up that i talked about create table as select okay uh, sorry i can't share the presentation i'll be sharing the material link so uh, presentation you can't get it is a, a microsoft policy unfortunately uh, that we are not allowed to share the presentation but definitely i'll be sharing the link i will be talking about the exam and i will be talking about the where you can study and all of that so don't worry towards the end uh, i will be talking about it okay so this is how you can create so you can use the ctas command you can use insert select okay these are various ways in which you can load data into the fact table or the dimension table okay you can use the data flow tool okay where we saw one of the destination is a warehouse so you can definitely do that so these are ways in which you can load the data so once you have loaded the data you need to know how to query it okay so that's what this section covers in the data warehouse so these are various ways in which you can query the data okay similar to your sql query sorry sql uh, query editor so you can just similar to your ssms okay you have the editor you can export the results in an excel file okay so this is how you do it you need to select that particular command and just click on export to excel and you will get an excel file and you can visualize the file in the excel uh, software as well okay then you can use the visual query editor this we have seen already okay so this is how uh, you can do we have seen how can you connect with the sql server okay then like i said you can use dax okay you can definitely do that but you need to model the data accordingly you need to uh, you can add uh, n number of um, you have to model first and then you can add n number of measures into your model okay you can do aggregation measures using the join operation group by all of those so basically when you are working with a warehouse in microsoft fabric okay you are basically using t sql language okay the base format in which you are using it is the t sql language so anything that you have if you know t sql you can use that in your warehouse so it works like a database and a warehouse at the same time but basically it's a warehouse okay so olap is executed so let's say your you can even use t sql to write a measure okay if you don't know dax you can use t sql to write a measure and this is how the output will be okay you can even extend that measure using t sql okay using join and aggregate function and this is how the output will look like you can create a snowflake okay you can join tables you can be you can normalize tables okay you can use something you, know, you can use a ranking functions also which are a part of the window functions in the t sql language okay so you can definitely use this as well so these are the ways in which you can query your data warehouse in microsoft fabric once you have queried you need to monitor your data warehouse there are various ways in which you can monitor the data warehouse okay so the first is that you can have a monitor capacity matrix so this is a app that you need to install from the power bi uh, sorry from microsoft fabric you need to install this particular app so i have already installed it so i'll just show it to you 
where you can act you can just monitor your data warehouses your basically your capacity in microsoft fabric okay any capacity so if you come to workspaces you have this installed you will you need to install it okay and it will give you a report and a semantic model so if you click on the report this particular app will talk about the capacity okay so here you need to add the capacity first you need to give it your capacity name so i have already given that and this is giving me a thorough report of my capacity if you see what kind of workspaces i have what kind of items do i have okay all that it is talking it is giving me the cu utilization on what date i had used and etc all of that okay so this is like a report that gets created you can even filter out let's say this is data warehouse you can even select all and you will get all the other things all the information so if you see here not just warehouses there but you have lake house you have pipelines okay you can even go for something specific like let's say you want to see how much how many of the things have failed so you want to count of the failed activities or failed items you can just filter that out and you will get it and it is not just affecting here it will affect even this visualization you can get the duration okay how long was the capacity on all that information you will get over here so you can see that for every data set what was the duration for data flow what was the duration how much capacity was utilized etc all that information you will get so you can use the matrix app to analyze data warehouses okay apart from that you have other uh tools as well you can use queries you can write queries to monitor the data warehouse okay uh, let's just look at the queries that you can use so this is your matrix app you can use queries so they are called as the dynamic management views okay they are like views that get created okay which will talk about the data warehouse in depth give you the activity what is actually going on in your data warehouse so these are the commands that you need to use okay so connections will basically talk about the connections that the data warehouse and between the connect in mean the engine and the warehouse okay sessions okay like who is the user and even the connection talks about that okay who who are the active users okay this sorry the request will do that who are the active users okay it will give you a list of active users who has written who has requested what okay all that information you will get over here if you want to get information about the session who is using that a particular session okay with along with i mean the name and etc of the user you can find that in the sessions okay you just have to say system sys dot dm underscore exe underscore connections sessions request. There are many more D DMVs. They are called as dynamic management views. There are two types of dynamic management views that you create. One you create on the entire data warehouse. Okay, that means on the server. And the second one is you do specifically on the databases. Okay, so those are the two types of. DMVs that get created. So the server will give you the server information, whereas the database ones will give you only the database information. Okay, so this is what you can do. You can even monitor queries. Okay, if you want to find out which query took how long, okay, go and see some historical queries. Uh, you know, see which query is being run frequently. Okay, again and again, which has a uh, a good frequency all that queries if you want to see you can do that using the query insights view so you, again these are also dmvs that you can use but these are the, but these work on queries whereas the dmvs that we talked here they work on either on the data warehouse as a whole that is the server or the database or the data warehouse that lies within it okay so these are some of the ways in which you can uh, monitor your data warehouse performance okay see whether a query has been executed or not performance you can analyze it 
either through the matrix app or through writing dnvs okay writing views okay on top of the data warehouse and you can get the system information that is there okay so this is what basically is covered in the module 3 which talks about data warehouse okay so this is what it is now let's take a 20 minute break okay 20 minute tea coffee break so just relax your uh, just let's do that i'll just start the timer
Hello, everyone. I hope you all are back. Please put a yes if you all are back. Yes, everyone, just put a yes if you all are back. Okay, so let's start with the final module of this program. Okay, so up till now we have seen, we have taken an overview of uh, Microsoft Fabric. Okay, we saw the introduction to it and what is one lake and all those features. Then we move to lake house. Okay, and then we move to the warehousing concepts in Microsoft Fabric. Now we will move our focus to entirely on Power BI. Okay, so we are going to see how uh, it has nothing much related to the fabric. Okay, this is more or less concepts on Power BI. Okay, uh, enterprise level solution uh, scaling of Power BI, how you can do. So we're going to just look at those techniques. Okay, and I'll just show you all one demo about the role level security in uh, Power BI when we move to the security of Power BI. So let me just share the presentation. And I'm hoping by 5.15, we should be done because it's a weekend. So I would like to, uh, we will, I would like to end it as soon as possible so that you all can enjoy the rest of the evening. So, um, <clears throat> Now, I told you all that Microsoft Fabric is something that is going to be used, okay, at an enterprise level, okay, and we all know that at an enterprise level, the size of the data or the data that we are working or dealing with, okay, is huge in size, right? It is massive. It is at times uh, coming from different sources, okay? It is com complex, okay? There's lots of complexity that is involved in it, and it is rapid. It is this it has a high velocity the <clears throat> the three v's of uh big data all apply over here then of course it is valuable it is very critical we all know okay whether it's the sales data it is marketing data it's the inventory data any kind of data that is there in an enterprise level architect or in an enterprise it is going to be critical and with the sheer size of volume, with the sheer size of complexity, with the sheer, with all of these things, okay, scalability is something that becomes very critical. Okay. We need to manage our data. We need our data to be processed faster because of which scalability becomes very critical. Now, what is scalability? Okay. Scalability, we all know, is something that handles the growth in the volume of the data. It is something that manages your data, okay? But depending on the way you have modeled it, okay? It will handle that volume of data, okay? So that is what is scalability, okay? The compute that you require, okay? Uh, in the background to process your data, okay? In order to uh, get your data analyzed, okay? Because you have thousands of rows, millions of rows, okay, when we are talking about enterprise level, fact table in, in its own will have around 500 million rows of data. How are you going to manage that? How are you going to accommodate that? How are you going to process that data? So for that, you need a better scalability plan. You need to model your data in such a way, okay, that you can accommodate these rows and not just that we saw that dimension tables keep on changing though they slowly change but they do change over a period of time right if i have to manage that change we need the compute we need our systems to be ready to handle that change okay and along with that okay along with that not just flexibility but the growth Okay, it has to be designed in such a way that they reduce the complexity and it is easily manageable. 
whether should I apply a star schema? Should I apply a snowflake schema? Because if you use snowflake schema, you get good performance. OK, but the data consistency or the integrity that we talk about, OK, is lost. OK, data, data integrity is lost. Whereas when we use snowflake schema, the data integrity is kept intact. It is intact, but the contradictory is performance goes down. So what is more critical to you? This is all these factors that you need to keep in mind when you are making your system scalable. You have your system should be capable enough to handle those things. So how do I design scalability? How do I design scalability is what we are going to see here. And that's where Power BI comes into picture. OK, Power BI has the capability of scaling out your solution. OK, uh, even Microsoft Fabric has it. OK, this particular thing has no relation like Microsoft Fabric and Power BI in this context have no relation with each other. This module solely focuses on Power BI, how you can scale your Power BI solution. OK. Um, how can you enforce security? How can you uh, how can you um, analyze the DAX queries that you write? How can you analyze the performance of your Power BI models? OK, and it talks about the best practices that are there. OK, so when we talk about uh, getting data into Power BI, OK, there are three modes of storage. OK. I'm just type it down. OK, when we get data in Power BI, there are three modes of storage, so storage modes of Power BI. The first is the import mode. Now, what does the import mode mean? OK, so when we are working with Power BI, Power BI uses a engine called as VertiPack. It is called as VertiPack engine where your DAX queries, your Power Query editor that you are using, OK, this is where those queries are analyzed, where your data is managed or stored, actually, I would say stored, OK? So when you load data or you get data into Power BI, you store it in three forms. One is the import mode. Now, import mode, uh, so I told you VertiPack is nothing but the engine response that Power BI uses. So along with the engine, you have a VertiPack cache. OK, you are or cache meaning memory or VertiPack memory. OK, so when we load data into Power BI, let's say I am loading data uh, using the import mode. So what happens is that in the import mode, the data is copied into the VertiPack cache. OK, a replica. OK, let's say you have a date. You have data coming from files. OK, whether it's an Excel file, text file, JSON file, XML file, any file. OK, generally when the data is coming from files, this mode is used in Power BI. OK. This is the mode that is used. So what does it do? So this generally is used when you when the size of your data. I'll just do one thing and write it down here. Size of the data. Is small. OK, that's where this particular mode is used because files don't have a big size, right? Uh, it can be easily copied into the cache. And if you recall, I had shown you all the licenses where the memory size is determined. It is nothing but the size of the VertiPack cache or the memory. OK, so depending on what license you have, you get the size. OK, and generally, if it is um, one GB of data or something, then 
your files can be copied into this, but that can't be the case with a database, correct? Or with a data warehouse. So there you have another storage mode called as the direct query, or in other terms, it is also called as a live connection. Okay, now what is this? If you recall, we had talked about shortcut feature, okay, where the shortcut is like a symbolic link that you create, okay, with your data source. It's like a connection string. Similarly, here also you can do that, okay, because the size of your data is large, okay, so data is not copied into the Verti pack cache. Okay, or the memory that is there. Okay, in and this is used where the size of your data is large, basically coming from a database or a data warehouse. Okay, so what will it do? Instead of loading the data into the cache, it will keep the data in the data source itself. Okay, it will create a connection similar to your shortcut, just a connection that, okay, I will, whenever I need the data, I will come to you and I will get it. Okay, so this is what basically direct query does. So what it will do, VertiPack cache, okay, will, whenever it requires data, okay, uh, that you are getting, let's say from a data warehouse or a database, it will go to the data source and uh, it will get that specific data at that specific time. Otherwise, there is no copy of the data stored okay, in the VertiPack cache. Whenever it requires data, it will go to the data source, get it, execute the DAX queries, execute the Power Query Editor, whatever queries you have done for transformations, and it will apply on top of the data. Once the job is done, okay, the connection will still be there. Okay, it will not, it is not something that is lost. It will still be there, just it will be triggered whenever it is required. So this is what is the direct query. The third mode is the dual mode, okay, which is nothing but a combination of your import mode and direct query. So some data you load and you keep a copy of that data in the VertiPack machine, in the VertiPack memory. Some you keep it at the data source itself. So that is called as a dual storage mode. So these are the storage modes that are there in Power BI. Okay, you can opt for any one of them. So depending on what kind of mode you are using, okay, there are best practices that have been listed. So for you, to model the data, okay? What kind of modeling you should do so that you can get, have been listed for optimal performance, okay? For the best, for the highest performance, there are a list of practices that have been listed. So if you're going for the import mode, what are the things that you should keep in mind? What are the best practices that are there you should keep in mind? All of that has been listed. Then for direct query, what are the different practices that you should keep in mind? All of those are listed. So this is what basically is covered in this particular module. Okay. Then that determines the scalability. You get the flexibility based on that. Okay. Uh, this is it. Now there are certain tools that you can use to analyze your performance in Power BI. Okay, the first tool is called as a performance analyzer. Okay, so this will kind of, it's like an in, it's an inbuilt tool in Power BI desktop application, which will give you a kind of an holistic uh, review of how your report is performing. Okay, how your report is performing. It will give you like a holistic view of that. 
okay it will explain how much time is a particular visual taking to refresh visual is okay it will specify that how long is the dax query taking to refresh or to get executed okay all that information is given in the performance analyzer okay now let's say you want to analyze only the dax query okay only how your dax query is executing okay how is whether it's a good measure it's a bad measure okay all that analysis if you have to do for that you have an external tool so this is an inbuilt tool where there, there are there is there are two external tools that you can use and if you want to analyze the dax queries okay you have a dax studio okay this is an external tool which you need to download okay there is a url uh which i will talk which i will be sharing when you get the learn links the url uh, and the labs when i share you will get the link for it as well okay so you need to download this specific studio okay and this is used to analyze your dax queries okay measures that you have written in that specific power bi file okay the dot pbix file that gets created you kind of specify all of that and you if you want to analyze how is it uh, you know affecting your performance okay how long is it taking to get executed only that okay you can do that using the dax studio now let's say you want to understand you want to compare so i talked about the best practices over here okay there are certain best best practices that you need to follow when you are modeling the data okay you are creating relationships or you are loading the data in terms of data types and etc okay so there are a list of best practices that microsoft has identified okay and they have put it into a they have kind of made rules out of it and they call it as bpa rules so it is called as best practice analyzer so this is also a external tool which you need to download which basically how does this work it will compare your model data model that you have created either star, star or snowflake schema okay with the list of rules that microsoft has identified as best practices okay so it's like a bpa uh rules i think something like this it's a json file i don't remember the file name but it's a bpa rules uh file okay it's a json dot json file which has all the list of best practices okay that uh, one should keep in mind uh when they are creating a, a data model okay about relationships about data types and etc okay and it also has lots of tools so that you can overcome those uh problems okay they call it as bp issues best practice issues which your which it will analyze and it will list it down to you and it will tell you okay these are the number of issues that your data model has this is what you need to work on okay so this is what basically best practice analyzer does okay so these are the three tools that you require okay when you are uh, dealing with the performance of power bi okay so this is in terms of performance so this is what this module talks about okay uh, it talks about the different storage mode it talks about the working of verti pack engine how does it work okay it has two components called as the formula engine and the storage engine so formula engine has a short form fe and this has a short form se okay so it will also give you uh, 
this is basically like the brain where your DAX queries, your power query editor queries that you have written actually is executed by the formula engine and the storage that I talked about, the storage modes, it is basically taken care by the storage engine. So VertiPack engine, it talks about the, I mean, how your VertiPack engine works, how does the formula engine and storage engine work in collaboration with each other, okay? So this is what this module basically talks about. OK, then it also talks about security. In Power BI. So security in Power BI is taken care by two things. You can apply two ways in which you can secure your model, your Power BI. One is the row level security. Or short form is RLS. And this is of two types that is static and dynamic. OK, static meaning you create. Now, what do I, what do I mean by row level security? First, let's just understand that. So let's say I have a uh, data in my uh, tables, OK, which I've loaded into Power BI. And there is one column which is uh, talking about which which is specific to the country. So let's say I have a order detail. I have an order uh, table which talks about the orders. OK, and uh, these orders have been shipped across the globe. OK, and let's say there are sales representative in those countries. OK, let's say USA, UK, etc. OK, so let's say I just want those sales representative who belong to the USA region only to see the US data and not any other region data. OK, so what will I do? I will create a role. Okay, I will create a role which will only showcase or display data specific to the US region and not more than that. Nothing more than that. OK, that kind of a role, that kind of an approach, OK, where you are restricting the access, OK, specific to the region is called uh, as the row level security. But keep in mind that particular region or that particular uh, data should be present in the column. OK, that should be available in the column. So that is called as a row level security. So the row, uh, the RLS that I talked about is static because you're giving region wise specific roles you're creating, correct? US. So what will you do? You will create a role specific to the region. OK, US region and to that US region, whoever is from the US region, OK, you will only give access to them for that role. So what will happen is that uh, OK, one thing we'll do, I'll just show it to you how it works. OK, I have a report, sample report. So let me just start my Power BI. Okay. I'm going to open a report and already have one. <laughs> OK, so let's say this is my report. OK, I have a report that I have created. This is how it will look like. So let's say I just want people from the US region to just view this or just uh, see the US data. So how do I create a role? OK, so for that you need to come to view. Oh, sorry, in modeling and in modeling you have this option called as manage roles. So if I click on this, okay, I've already created roles. Let me just delete these quickly so that you all can see how to create one. All I have to do is come here, just say new role. OK, give this a name. So let's say USA. OK, and you have to
to save it. Yeah. So here, what I have to do now, I have only one table that is there. Okay, so what I will do, I'll just say uh, new. Okay, and from this, I will just select the country. So what I will do, I'll just, I have a column called as ship country, where the data of the particular region where my order has been delivered or has been shipped, okay, is, is the column that, this is the column that it consists. Okay, so like I told you, I just want data related to the US to be seen. So what I will do, I'll just select ship country, I'll say equals, and I'll just say USA. Okay, so if you have to see the DAX equivalent, you need to know DAX for this. So if you switch to this, this is how the DAX is written. Just one minute, let me have some water. <clears throat> okay, so this is the equivalent DAX. So what will happen the moment I save this? Okay, now let's uh, test this role. Okay, so let's say somebody belongs to the US region. Okay, and uh, he or she wants to view the report. So what will happen if you see here, I have a role. I'll just select this role and the moment I say, okay, only data related to the US region will be visible to that person, okay, will be visible to that person. Now, if I stop viewing, now let's just publish, sorry, they save this changes, publish this report to the Power BI. So I'll just say publish and I publish it to this workspace. So it has been published. Now I can go to the workspace and here you should see the report that I have published, which is this. Okay. So now if I have to add people to this role, so I need to come to that semantic model, come to security. Okay. Now can you see the role has been applied? Now let's say Archie belongs to the US region. She's working from the US region and I just want to show her data related to that. So what I will do, I'll just say, mention her name here. Okay. I'll just say add. And now a role has been added. So when Archie will get this or will receive an access to this, the date, the uh, report that she will see will only be of Okay, so I can just come here, test save the, this thing. I don't know why it's not able to do that, but she will see the role that I just showed you all over here, the exact same role, okay, that is the US data, okay, only this report she will be able to see, even the report too that is there, only US data she will be able to see, and if you click on the slicer, only US data she will be able to see, okay, so this is what is a static role level row level uh, security that you can apply to your power bi reports okay the other is the dynamic now dynamic meaning let's say you want to go according to the email addresses of your uh, uh, users or let's say sales representative so let's say you want something to be dynamically added so let's say based on the email address Okay, based on that, you want to give access. So let's say I have an employee who wants to review his sales report. Okay, so why should he see the other uh, uh, sales, em sales employees report? I will only give access or I will just let him access the report uh, pertaining to him. So what he has to do is to just enter the email address, okay, his email address and only that data, okay, will be given or only that report will be showed to him. So that kind of an RLS is called as a dynamic row level security. But keep in mind, there has to be a column 
which has email addresses and that email address has to be a part of so let's say uh, rg has to be a part of my email address column then only i will be able to apply row level security to it the other is the other security that you can apply is the object level security it is termed as OLS short form. So this particular security you can apply if you have a premium license. OK, you need a premium license in order to work with it. So here you are securing in the row level. You are just securing based on the roles or sorry, based on the row. Like that data has to be present in that particular column in that particular table. So let's say I want to even secure the metadata of my table okay for that we need to use the object level security so these are some of the ways in which you can uh secure your power bi reports dashboard so this is what the module talks about apart from this it also talks about creating relationships okay modeling performing creating relationships meaning uh the cardinalities. OK, one is to one. One is to one. One is to many. OK, many is to many or many. One is many is to one. And many is to many. So this is what it basically talks about, how you can create relationships. OK, uh, in Power BI, using the Power BI desktop, Power BI services, OK, cardinalities that are there. OK, then it talks about the relationship evaluation. How does. How does Power BI. Evaluate a relationship that you have created, whether it's one is to many or whether it is many is to many, what kind, how does it evaluate? OK, there is certain uh, names that it gives. It is called as a regular relationship or a limited regular uh, relationship. So all that you get to study in this particular module. OK. Uh, and what else is there? Um, yeah, and it talks about scaling. How can you scale at an enterprise level? OK, it talks about scalability at enterprise level. So first of all, if you're working with a pre, I mean, you're working at an enterprise. OK, it is ideal that you at least have a premium license. OK, it is ideal that you have a premium license. OK, apart from that, if you have a premium license, you have a feature called as XMLA endpoint. OK, now what does this mean? Let's say you want to get data or you want to access data from other cloud services. OK, so this is Microsoft, but let's say you want to access data from uh, other external data sources of other clouds. OK, so that is enabled through the XMLA endpoint, and that is only available if you have a premium license. And of course, you need to enable this feature, your Power BI admin or Microsoft Fabric admin, OK, needs to. Be enabled by the admin only. Then, of course, other thing that it talk up the, this particular module talks about is source control. And uh, deployment. Pipelines, OK, uh, source control, meaning from where you are getting the data, how can you manage the source? So we all know the version control systems, VCS, OK, that is Git, Azure DevOps, etc. So how can you manage those source using those particular tools? OK, it talks about that in depth and like now when we are working in the deployment stage, so we all know there are three stages in a deployment that is development. You have testing that is the test and finally you put everything to production. So how can you manage that? 
Okay, so if you come to the Power Microsoft Fabric service, come to your workspace, you see you have this option of create deployment pipeline. Okay, so if you click on this, it will create a pipeline. So I'll just say deployment webinar pipeline. I'll just call this. Just say next. So you, here you can see you can you can these are the basic stages you can even add another stage if you want to okay so just say create and you will get a pipeline so we'll just add to these stages okay you can assign different workspaces so what is the advantage of assigning different workspaces let's say you don't want people who are in the testing stage okay we have people who hired to do the testing of our products of our applications or of our website so we don't give full access to them, right? We just give some limited access. Okay, so you can segregate them. Instead of giving one workspace to all, you can just create three different workspaces and you can just um, do selective deployment. Let's say I don't want to give workspace access. I don't want to give warehouse access. I don't want to give notebook access to other people. Okay, you can definitely do that by uh restrict by just restricting the access to a specific workspace and you can assign different different workspaces so as of now i'm just assigning the webinar workspace to this to the development stage you can come to your workspace and you can create a new workspace and just say this is a testing workspace something like this and just say apply so what will happen now if you go to your pipeline? OK, you can just say skip as of now. You can come here. And you can give only the testing workspace over here. And you can just say assign a workspace. So what will happen? So you can now select certain items from this workspace and you know move it to the next stage in your deployment pipeline so that is how you do even in your deployment right whenever you deploy an application create an application not all things you deploy to the next stage some things you keep it at the development stage some things you put it in the testing stage so this is what you can do here so this sign basically indicates that your items are not matching content within this workspace and this workspace is not the same so that is why you get it so if i say deploy and I just say continue and just say deploy all the content from this workspace. So certain things are not supported. OK, will be deployed from the development stage to the testing stage. OK. I don't know why it hasn't happened. I think it's still working, but you can just have a look at it. It's this is how it will work. OK, uh, so you can select you can select which one to deploy so you can individually go and you can deploy it. So if you see here. Uh, OK, you can do a selective deployment as well. OK, and you can deploy only specific items to the next stage. As of now, it is not working. I don't know, uh, but it's OK. Like you can go through that also i'll share the link for it so this is also uh these are the basically the concepts that you will study okay in the last module it has nothing much to do with fabric as of this but you can explore in terms of power bi but you need to know power bi okay if you have to work with this so with this we end the modules there are four modules okay so i'll just talk about the exam and all of that and then we will uh then archie session and then we can drop off for then we can end for the day okay so let me just uh talk about from where can you study the okay so this certification is called as DP 600. OK, it's a certification that talks about implementing analytical solutions using Microsoft Fabric. OK, it is covering very few things. So you saw these were the four 
modules that we saw. The first module is just an introduction. OK, and this is the weightage of the modules. If you see the second module is very important. That is talking about lake houses and warehouses. Security is very important. OK, and these are the modules from where you can study. OK, whatever I have talked about. OK, you can study from there. I'll just share this. Link with your. In the chat box. OK. So the lake house, the warehouse concepts, you have semantic model, which is nothing but Power BI. And then, of course, we talked about the uh, scalability, enforcement of security, about uh, relationships, etc. All of that is being covered in this particular module. OK. Sorry. OK. And let's say you have prepared. OK, you are done with the study. OK, you can come here. And you can schedule the exam, okay, which is uh, done through the Pearson View or the Sorty Port uh, portals, okay. The Microsoft has tied up with them. So this is the cost INR cost. I'll just uh, show that to you all. So this is the INR cost of DP six hundred. Okay, you can come here and you can schedule. That is a free practice assessment. You can take that assessment and you can test your knowledge. How much you know? How much you don't know? OK, you can come here. You can first of all prepare from here. So whatever we have seen, we have not gone in depth, guys, uh, because it's just a webinar. It's not a training. The training is of four days, OK, uh, where you learn in depth about how actually Microsoft Fabric runs in the background. OK, then this is the study guide. If you click on this, this link also I'll share with you separately. So this is the study guide for DP 600. Uh, what are the modules? What kind of modules you need to focus on? All of that has been listed over here. So just have a quick overview of this. OK, who should give the exam? What is the weightage? OK, according to the modules. OK, uh, licensing, etc. All that is very, very important. OK, in Microsoft Fabric. One lake or, and the data warehousing concepts, all of that is very critical. So you can just come here and get an overview of the study guide. OK, then there is a sandbox for you to experience the exam. If you are a first timer, OK, uh, I hope you all are not. But if you are a first timer, OK, just come to the sandbox and you can get a full experience as to how the exam looks like. What is the environment of the exam? OK, um, there is no negative marking. You don't have to uh, perform any lab. Yeah, I'll share the lab link as well. So this is a GitHub repository which has all the Microsoft Fabric labs. OK. In it. OK, so this is how your. Sandbox, or this is the exact same environment as how your Microsoft Fabric DP 600 exam will look like. OK, so this is the certification. I, I, it's running very slow, but you can just definitely come here and experience the sandbox. OK, so you can just click on next. And just click on next, etc. So lots of things. So this is how it will look like. You will have case study based questions. There is no negative marking. OK, again, the passing percentage or the passing marks is 700 out of 1000. OK, all uh, the same as any uh, Microsoft fabric. I mean, sorry, Microsoft exam that is there. OK, so yeah, this is it. So this is from where you can study, from there you can practice, where you can come and schedule. And that's it. Uh, Archie, over to you. Thank you everyone for attending on a Saturday. OK, I hope it was a great session, insightful session, and at least a kickstart to go into Microsoft Fabric. And guys, this particular service is going to grow very big in enterprises. 
enterprises have already started moving into it. So if you get yourself certified on this, it will be a great, great tool to work on. So thank you everyone for attending. Archie, over to you. If you are there. So guys, Archie has shared a feedback form. I request all of you all to please uh, fill that feedback form so that we can improve our trainings in future, improve this webinar wherever required. So please do not leave the session without um, giving us your feedback. Okay, and if, if you have any questions, please put it in the chat box. I will definitely answer those questions. But please do not leave the session without giving us your feedback. You will get the badges. Uh, uh, you will have to purchase the license. That is the only other option. If your E5 trial license expires, uh, purchasing the license is the only solution. Apart from that, you can't uh, work on Microsoft Fabric. You need to be a part of an enterprise. You need to have an E5, E3 license, either of which or and plus with that a Microsoft Fabric license. So you need to be a part of the domain. Yeah. So apart from that, there is no other way you can do it. So guys, once you complete the feedback, okay, uh, please put a done in the chat box. And once you complete it, you can leave the session. Have a great evening. Thank you everyone for attending this webinar. And all the best for your Microsoft Fabric experience. Uh, it's a great tool to work with. So please do not leave it halfway. Yes, you will get a, a URL. Okay, uh, Archie will be sharing it over the mail with your. Okay, uh, she will definitely be doing that over the mail as mentioned before. So please, you will get a certificate of this training, so you don't have to worry about it. So thank you, everyone, the ones who have given us your feedback. You all can leave the session. Rest, please give us your feedback and then leave the session. And have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you.